Hi, this is Mike Spivey. I'm a partner at the Spivey Consulting Group, and I wanted to take about five minutes. I've been, I've been um, asked <laughs> too many times to count in my career what makes for a successful applicant, and there's tremendously nuanced answers I could give, but I wanted to give the 30,000 foot level um, what I've seen in my 20 years of doing this and what my partners at Spivey Consulting have seen in our 100 plus years of doing this. I'm going to um, <clears throat> try to make it parsimonious and simple and boil it down to two, two factors. The first factor is differentiation. And for a second, I want you to put yourself not in an in a <clears throat> applicant's perspective, but in a dean of admissions or an admissions officer's uh, shoes, which is hard to do. It's hard to wear their hat because you've never done it. That's why um, we have a company. We, we have all made admissions decisions. But I'm going to let you be the de dean of admissions for a second. And what happens is you get hundreds of applications a day and thousands in a cycle at most of the schools you'll be applying to. And they all start... Um, at some level, most start um, sounding the same, looking the same, and those are the ones that are read much more quickly. They're actually decided upon much more slowly, and those are the ones where you generally don't get an elevating uh, factor. We, in admissions, we use terms like boost or elevating. They're not de-elevating. You know, most applications co don't come in hot or cold. They kind of come in... Um, undifferentiated. What's the easiest way to differentiate? Far and away the LSAT. If you're going to invest time, resources, or financial resources into anything, first it should be the LSAT. There's qu uh, quantitative data that a very small percentage of people score in the upper bandwidths and the highest bandwidth on the LSAT. So that is by definition differentiation. If you're in the top 1%, you are differentiating from 99% of the applicants. The LSAT is weighted slightly higher in law school admissions for US News rankings, 12% versus 10% of GPA. So there too, it, it, there's a, a little bit more of a, of a metric that um, is, care, is paid attention to. Another great way to differentiate is with a strong GPA, a 4.0, a 4.1, a 3.9. Those are differentiating. It's a little less differentiating because we've seen over, since I started this many years ago, we've seen great inflation. We do, as admissions officers, have data to compare schools versus schools about where your GPA is. But in general, you will stand out if your GPA is, a str is stronger than the competition. You are in stacks of files you're in uh, e-folders of files <clears throat> that automatically differentiate you if you're above the school's medians. So that's at the quantitative level. At the qualitative level, there's many, many, many ways to differentiate. This is going to be a five-minute to six-minute podcast, and I'm already at uh, minute three and a half. So um, you know that's where your personal statement, your interviews, your essays, your letters of continued interest, your campus visits come in. But what I, the second part, which goes hand in hand with the differentiation, is as follows: successful admissions is about the aggregation of marginal gains when we're not talking about those two quantitative numbers. I want you to keep that phrase in mind the aggregation of marginal gains. When I was a dean, I wasn't just, my former life wasn't just admissions, I was also over um, a whole career services department during the Great Recession. And when I would talk to our students about getting a job, I always told the story, which is now in a book called The Surprising Power of Atomic Habits, or, or the name of the book is uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, um, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results. I recently read it, and he tells a story in this recently published book that I used to tell students years ago during the recession, which is about the, the British cycling team. He has much more details than I did. I sort of had a vague understanding. But since 1908 to 2013, the British, or 2003, the British cycling team had not won a single gold medal or a single Tour de France. They hired a coach. His name was Dave Brailsford in 2003 and he started small balling that's a baseball term 
every little thing, again, the aggregation of marginal gains, what kind of temperature the room was in in the lighting when, when they slept, the chemical composure of the massage gels they used on the, on the cyclist, um, the, the um, aerodynamics of the water bottles that were attached to their bikes. Every little detail they small-balled. From 2007 to 2017, British cyclists won 178 world championships and 67 Olympic or Paralympic gold medals. Keep in mind they hadn't won a single one since 1908 in five Tour de France's. It is the same in admissions. If you can take every little detail of your file, no matter, or your interaction with schools, and we have hundreds upon hundreds of blogs about these little details, including t knowing time zones, right? So when you send an email to a school, I, now I'm talking again about the aggregation of the, of the tiny 1%. When you email a school and you say, I'm in central time zone, I know you're in eastern time zone, so uh, my understanding is our call is at 2 p.m. eastern time zone, you come across as a professional, someone who's gonna be employable by law firms. If you read the Wall Street Journal every morning, a couple months before your on-campus interviews, something is going to come out during that interview where law firms are going to say, this person is a business professional. They speak in the vernacular of business professionals. What, if you're listening to this podcast, what I would like for you to do more than anything is think about those two factors. How do I differentiate in a positive way, right? So robbing a bank would be differentiating, probably not good for your law school application. How, what is it about me that's differentiated in a, in a, in a positive way? And in every interaction I have to, with a school, how do I, do I make sure that the period at the end of a sentence with quotes is inside this, the quotations instead of outside? That's a very common mistake of applicants. Can I take every aspect of my application at the highest nuanced level and submit a buttoned up, operationalized professional application because the, the aggregation of all of that makes you seem like a professional and professionals want to be around professionals. If you want to have a successful law school application, if you want to punch above your numbers, differentiate and small ball those little details. Put another way, the number of applications submitted to any school that differentiate qualitatively alone are rather small. And then when you throw in the number of applications that are both qualitatively interesting and differentiating and are buttoned up to every I dotted and every T crossed, those are exceptionally rare. You see very few, extraordinarily few applications in law school admissions that don't have some mistakes in them. Again, there, the, a few mistakes aren't uh, hurting you, but they're not. But when you reverse engineer the people that punch well above their numbers, when we go in and we say, "How did this person with a uh, with a one sixty five and a three point nine? This is uh, someone from this past cycle, uh, non URM, get into six of the top fourteen schools, including Harvard?" And you and you look at their application. You see a very qualitatively differentiated application, and you see um, essentially a flawless application, and that stands out to the school. Uh, again, this has been Mike Spivey with Spivey Consulting Group. I hope this video helped. If you like this advice, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel because there's a good deal more coming soon uh, that's on the way.